Well, hello. Fancy meeting you here. Welcome to DSP Reacts. It must be Sunday. React day here on the channel, where I throw a little show called DSP vs. the Internet. Every Sunday, I come together with the viewers, and we watch clips from all over the Internet of various variety topics. I really enjoy the show. Usually, there's something fun, whether it's something funny, something cringy, something informative, and you learn something, something cute. There's always something going on on the show, and I like the fact that there's variety, and I don't really know what to expect in any particular uh you know videos that we're going to be watching here okay <clears throat> i will say one thing up front i did actually screen the clips pretty well this week meaning i made sure that they're all from approved reliable sources as you can see uh so that we don't have anything out of the ordinary happening on the stream we had some troll activities over the last couple of weeks tri people trying to sneak in some naughty clips and bad stuff, and I got rid of that this week. We should have no issues with that whatsoever. Thankfully, it will be a nice, smooth show. If you like the show and you like the premise, please become a member today. If you become an Ultra member, we are guaranteed to watch your clips, and that's what we're going to do right now is watch the Ultra member submissions. If you become a submissions tier, well, you go into a randomized playlist where everyone has an equal chance to be watched, particularly with the amount of clips and the length of the clips we have for this week, we may end up actually watching like all of the clips this week <clears throat> okay we'll see so all right here we go guys it's time to begin episode 70 of dsp versus internet thanks very much by the way one other thing summertime has hit here in the united states officially it began yesterday or the day before perhaps some of you would like to submit clips that are summer themed it's nice to have like seasonal theming and summertime there's tons of different topics that can be covered that are summertime related so maybe you want to think about that Okay. All right, cool. Let us begin at the beginning. And by the way, please let me know how the volume level sounds if I need to adjust it. This is the same guy from last week with a different clip here. Let's see what it's about. More things that never left the cutting room. Floor. Oh, it's way low. Some interesting developments have happened regarding certain characters between the last video and now, which I'll get into later. So, no long preamble for me here or anything. Here's a few more characters cut from the Capcom vs. games. So, ca characters that were cut from the Capcom vs. games. Okay. Even going back to the very first game in the series, X-Men vs. Street Fighter, there's some interesting choices made roster-wise. The most interesting of which is Cammy. Cammy herself was a fairly popular character from her debut in Super Street Fighter 2 onwards, so her being in this isn't the interesting part, but more so, her design. Instead of the Delta Red operative we got in Super SF2, we instead get Cammy in an entirely new design, depicting her stint as a Shadowloo operative under Bison, something that, which at that point in time, had only ever been mentioned in canon in Cammy's new challengers ending. Capcom went on to include Cammy as a secret bonus character in Street Fighter Alpha 2 Gold which was a home conversion of the Japanese exclusive arcade update to the second Alpha game, Street Fighter Zero Two Alpha. She'd later show up in Street Fighter Alpha 3, where the plot starts giving some context for her time serving under Bison. Yeah, so he, this guy is misinformed. I can actually make a correction here, which he probably isn't aware of. Cammy appeared in Alpha 2 Gold first, and Capcom at the time was absolutely infamous for reusing content in the fighting games, okay? All, like, so reusing content at all times. So, they were going to reuse a sprite somehow for the Versus. Like, literally, most of the sprites in the Versus games are always reused, okay? So, in this case, they just said, what's the latest Kami sprite that we have? Oh, we just drew a new sprite for Street Fighter Alpha 2 Gold. Just use that in the Versus series. So that's what they did. So that's why she appears in this like uh, outfit, looks like a soldier, as opposed to her uh, her Super Street Fighter Two appearance, where she looks very different. That's all it is. So they're just reusing sprites. He seems to think that it was an actual selection choice to make her look like that in in uh, X Men vs Street Fighter. That's incorrect, actually. No, they just reused the sprite from Alpha Two Gold, which came out first. As it turns out, though, this apparently wasn't going to be the only time the Versus games planned to debut something new for a Street Fighter character. Hidden in the code of Marvel Super Heroes vs. Street Fighter lie unused sprites for one Miss Cotton Kanzuki, who, as we know, that's just Sakura with a head swap. 
Do you see what my point is? These are just, it's Capcom being lazy, which they were back in the day. They were pulling out so many games. They didn't want to constantly be redrawing art. So they would just reuse art over and over. That's literally Sakura with Karen's head and shorts. It's the same sprite. You see that? Didn't make her playable debut until a year later in Street Fighter Alpha 3. She did, however, first appear in the Sakura Ganbaru manga, which chronicled Sakura's exploits within the time frame of the Alpha series. Her unused sprites reflect this as well. She's a head swap of Sakura, but notably yep. has different footwear in line with her design from the manga. It's possible that she was going to initially play like Sakura too. And I feel exactly. There were actually several characters in that game, Marvel Superheroes vs. Street Fighter, that were just palette swaps. There was a, a US agent who was just Captain America, but different color and he played a little different. Um, there was a different black card as well. I can't remember what he was called. But yeah, so yeah, it was just a palette swap just with a different head. And then probably what they did is they decided to make her a full-fledged character for Alpha 3. I feel like that might be a part of why they ended up scrapping her. Marvel Super Heroes vs. Street Fighter in general was put together in a shorter time frame and on a tighter budget than X-Men vs. Street Fighter. A point I mentioned in a previous video talking about Symbiote Spider-Man being pitched for the same game. Maybe they didn't have the time to dedicate- Okay, fast forward. <laughs> Denied by both Marvel and Capcom USA Howard the Duck? as well as other team members. Both Capcom and Marvel were well aware of how badly the Howard the Duck movie went down, and the development team wanted to step away from dedicated Joe characters after having Nori Morrow in the previous game. She-Hulk was also another character proposed for the game, and she would have broken the fourth wall the same way Deadpool does in Marvel vs. Capcom 3, something uh. She-Hulk lampshades herself in that game. You know, if this game were made in 1991, I'd be the one whacking you with a health bar. Uh, okay. One of the <laughs> most interesting proposals for the game, though, was for its final boss, who, hilariously enough, also ended up being fully realized in Marvel 3. Oh, Galactus. I... Marvel 3, like when I played it, I played it through I played through arcade mode. I played it online a bit. Didn't really like it as much as Marvel 2. I barely remember it. I seriously barely remember Marvel 3. It's sad because you know I loved all the Versus series up to Marvel 3, and I feel like Marvel 3 was a was them to try to make it more mainstream, just making it flashy, but not playing well. So I didn't really like it. But so many people loved it at the time. Like I didn't even remember Galactus was the boss of Marvel 3. I totally forgot about it. <laughs> Katsuya Agitomo, a former Capcom staffer who helped familiarize the team with Marvel in general, spoke about this in particular in a Twitter thread a couple years back. He initially proposed Galactus as the main villain and final boss of Marvel 1, and while the dev team seemed to have no problem with it, Marvel, who'd been pretty lax with their roster choices up to that point, actually vetoed it, citing that Galactus isn't someone that could be easily beaten, let alone Duh. by anyone in the cast. Akitomo, flexing his Marvel knowledge, stood his ground actually shot back at Marvel by explicitly mentioning a time where Galactus was beaten by heroes in a physical confrontation. Issue 243 of Fantastic Four, which saw the Fantastic Four take down Galactus with the help of the Avengers. <laughs> he added that they'd even come up with a justification for Galactus even being able to be taken on by the cast. He'd be hungry, which might sound silly to non-comic book fans, but within the Marvel Universe itself, Galactus is canonically at his weakest when he hasn't consumed planets for a very long time. Right. Okay. So Galactus was going to be the boss, but they changed it. Okay, what else? <clears throat> Capcom vs. SNK2 has three Capcom character editions in particular that were a bit unexpected. Kiyosuke from Rival Schools, yep. Eagle from the first Street Fighter game, yep. and Maki from Final Fight 2 in particular. I didn't remember Interviews she was from Final Fight 2. The development team indicated that they wanted some characters on both sides of the roster that would make fans of either company go, wow, I haven't seen them in a long time. Something that likely influenced the inclusion There's of Toto. Ruhaku Toto, who to this day has only ever been playable in the first Art of Fighting game and CVS 2 itself. Yeah. Maki is the one we're going to focus on here, because as it turns out, Capcom originally had a different female beat -em up protagonist in mind. According to the aforementioned interviews with the developers, the original plan was for Maki's roster spot to go to Lin Kudasawa, the protagonist of Capcom's 1995 Aliens vs. Predator Oh, wow. Up. This game is so good. It's a 2D beat-em-up side-scroller, Aliens vs. Predator, where you could be two space marines or play as a predator. 
It's really, really good, but tons of people have never heard of it. Everyone knows Final Fight. Everyone knows Streets of Rage, but no one ever heard of this one. Maybe it's just because it was a licensed deal, but it's a superb beat-em-up game. Lin herself seemed to be a pretty popular character, not just among fans, but Capcom staff as well, as she cameos in the backgrounds of a few Street Fighter stages, and Simone and Cannon Spike is a pretty obvious homage to Lin's character design and moveset. However, there's a reason that she was eventually relegated to easily missed background cameos and design send-ups, and it's the same reason why she couldn't be put in the CVS too. Our good old friend, licensing issues. Yeah. You see, Aliens vs Predator is a licensed game, one of many Capcom worked on in the 90s alongside stuff like Cadillacs and Dinosaurs, oh, yeah. Marvel Fighters, and Spawn to name a few. Oh, I didn't even know they made a Spawn when game. Asawa was no Oh, they made the Spawn Arcade game? I didn't even know that. I saw it in arcades, but I never really played it because it was like a shooter game. Holy shit, I didn't know they, that Capcom even made that. Original character Capcom <clears throat> designed for the game, but... Alright, so they wanted her and they couldn't get her because of licensing it. Got it. Let's keep going. <laughs> no fight to appearance. This cut kind of stings as a massive fan of Alien vs. Predator, but it also illustrates... No, it's the same thing. They're still talking about this. Okay. Whether it's worth it or not in the end is probably a subject for a different video, though. As I mentioned in the previous video, Tatsunoko vs. Capcom had a laundry list of characters revealed by the developers themselves that- How many people- Okay, genuine question for the viewers here. How many people here played Tatsunoko vs. Capcom? Did literally anyone on this stream play it? Anyone watching on demand, did you ever play it? For me, I, I never played it. Um, it was like the missing versus game because versus games hadn't been around for a very, very long time. The last one was Marvel vs. Capcom 2. And then all of a sudden, Atsunoko vs. Capcom comes out. It's a Wii only game. And it's a fighting game that plays similar to the versus series. It's the same premise. Only you might say, what in the holy hell is Tatsunoko? It's a Japanese uh, culture, like manga series, like pop culture stuff. All these weird characters. I don't know who any of them are. <laughs> so they did this crossover game. I didn't play it. Almost no one did. It, it, it became like this missing relic game where most people outside of Japan never touched it because they were so centered on having like Japanese characters, these Tatsunoko characters, and no one outside of Japan knew who they were. So it just didn't sell well. I've never even seen it in action. Were considered and eventually scrapped. What's particularly interesting about the list is that oh, you can draw some conclusions based on characters that ended up making it to the game's eventual 2010 update and Marvel vs. Capcom 3, which had secretly begun development the same year that Tatsunoko vs. Capcom originally released in arcades. Makes sense. You have characters like Arthur and Hashenko, who ended up being saved from Marvel 3, as well as Yatterman 2 and Joe the Condor, who eventually ended up in the aforementioned Ultimate All-Stars update. There's even characters on the shortlist where you can infer which characters were chosen over them instead. I think Princess Tiara from Gaia Master was more than likely passed up in favor of Saki, as they both hail from fairly obscure Japanese-only quiz and board games. Saki herself coming from yeah, Quiz what is this? Dreams. Like, what the fuck is this? Zero Goki, <laughs> a giant robot version of Akuma that oh my god, robot Akuma, a bonus character in the PlayStation One and Sega Saturn ports of Cyberbots, most likely lost out to PTX, who represents Lost Planet instead. But there's two characters on this list I find interesting because they represent a roster niche that Tatsunoko vs. Capcom completely ignores, perhaps intentionally so. Mirai King Boss of the Neo Human Kashan series and M. Bison from Street Fighter. Bison isn't a stranger to the Versus games, having been in three Marvel vs. games as well as both Capcom vs. SNK games. Mirai King Boss is where it gets interesting though, as it only highlights that there are very few, if any, villains in the game at all. Duronjo is the closest you get, and she's generally a comic relief villain at that. Duh. Moreover, what would have made this duo even more interesting is the fact that Bison's character design is directly inspired by Breaking Boys himself. Look at that! In previous like the videos, same character. I mentioned that the influence. That's interesting. That Bison was inspired by a Japanese character. They were gonna have them both in a fighting game. That is kind of neat. Street Fighter okay. character representing three, and we all know that Alex was meant to be the main character of that game. Still, it's a shame. Bison had kind of a theme of forming a big bad duo with characters in opposing companies in prior versus games, like with Magneto in X Men vs. Street Fighter and Geese in Capcom vs. SNK. Funnily enough, 
the other Riken boss inspired character I mentioned earlier, Sigma, would go in the form of the basis of one of these Versus series duos, appearing and eventually fusing with Marvel's supervillain Ultron in Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite. Marvel vs. Capcom 3, like Tatsunoko vs. Capcom directly before it, also has a bunch of characters that were considered but eventually scrapped for the game. Two that stung particularly for me were Fo Lu and Nina from the Breath of Fire series. Alright, I think at this point, we can move on to the next video. I feel like I'm kind of getting bored of the missing characters. <laughs> By the way, thank you Ross Prey who became a member. I appreciate that Ross Prey, thanks for joining during the stream. Alright, let's see what the next video is. <clears throat> AI is everywhere, and everyone is talking about it, but as it turns out, the vast majority of what they're saying is misleading at best, and at worst, an outright deception. What, While what a surprise! your smartwatch or your new co-pilot PC is called AI, it's not the AI that you're probably thinking of. So we're going to take a reality hammer to this hype machine and break down what AI can do what it can't do, and why the tech industry is so eager to slap the AI label on absolutely An AI screwdriver. And guys, this rabbit hole goes way deeper than you think. Okay, predictably it ends at money, but the path to get there, it turns out, is really confusing on purpose, which makes it very interesting. Like this interesting message from our sponsor. No, and how dare you have a sponsor, unacceptable. Okay, let's continue. The creations like Commander Data, HAL 9000, and GLaDOS. Uh. These are computers or machines that demonstrate a capacity for reason, however naive, twisted, or alien it might seem to us meatbags. Now you'd be forgiven for thinking that that's still the definition of AI. A lot of people seem to think that it is. But in reality, the meaning of words is ever-shifting, and we would now refer to these characters as having AGI, or Artificial General Intelligence. Artificial General Intelligence as opposed to what's not General Intelligence. I don't get it. What you're referring to as AI, then, is in fact Narrow AI, or as I've taken to calling it, ANI. ANI is not a general intelligence unto itself, but rather another component of a fully functioning system made useful by specialized algorithms and data processing utilities forming a complete artificial intelligence system. So YouTube has AI in place to refine search results and have the algorithm run, but YouTube is not sentient. There's no sentient. It's not an actual self-aware creature is, I guess, what he's getting at. Okay, that makes sense. Didn't think I could make that point in the style of Richard Stallman's famous interjection? Well, I could, haha, -ha. but I also didn't have to. That previous paragraph was actually written by GPT-4 Omni, and this is exactly the sort of thing that modern AI does very well. And that's because most of the time when we hear the term AI, we're actually referring to machine learning. Machine learning, learning. A yes, subset okay. Of AI involving algorithms that can analyze patterns in data. They get trained on things like text, multimedia, or even just raw number outputs. And using this training data, they identify patterns through statistical probability. They can be further trained through reinforcement learning then by rewarding correct outputs and punishing incorrect outputs, kind of like training a hamster. The results allow these algorithms to summarize, predict, or even generate something seemingly new. And in many cases, they are so impressive that a good machine learning system can be indistinguishable from classic AI or AGI. Well then, Linus, if it looks like an AI and it quacks like an AI, what's the difference? Well, artificial narrow intelligence is limited to specialized tasks. GPT-4 Omni, specifically, is a large language model, which means that- So it can only do language stuff. It's not going to all of a sudden have a way to now be doing other things outside of something that involves dialogue, right? Chat GT GPT is never going to jump out and be able to control all the electronics in your house and do its stuff for you. All it can do is, through the confines of the chat, tell you stuff. Right. Okay. That makes sense. It is trained to understand and generate natural language, like the words I'm speaking now. It's basically an autocomplete on steroids. 
What sets it apart from your phone's keyboard, though, is that it can also process information based on patterns that are learned during training. So here's the thing. Even though ChatGPT is limited to the chat, you could train it to integrate with other things. Like, for example, maybe you could say to ChatGPT, hey, order me a pizza. And if it has integration with a pizza app, it could actually order you said pizza if you give it the correct information, right? But it has to be designed to cross train and work with other things. It can't just do it of its own, i.e. it's not sentient. It can't learn for itself. Including definitions, mathematical formula, and Makes so sense. on and so forth. That makes it capable of generating unique output that wasn't part of its training data. GPT has traditionally been incapable of image, video, or audio generation. There are other types of generative models, like Sora, Suno, or Dolly, that feature their own specific talents, but mm. most of them are incapable of operating outside of their specific niche, and all of them are limited by their training data in a similar manner. And because they are limited by their training data, in many cases, the answers that they give resemble their training data, which, if you're an artist or a photographer and your work gets added to a model, uh, is probably wow. not your idea of fair use, much less a good time. Worse, when generative models are faced with a concept that they don't understand, or they simply run out of tokens, they can begin to hallucinate. That is oh, to no. say, they just make things up as they go, which is why sometimes you get eldritch abominations like these. <laughs> With that said, these limitations don't mean that machine learning AI is a dead end. It's been deployed very effectively for diagnosing diseases and in other highly complex scenarios where the data is dense and the conclusions require interpretation. These specialized models are extremely useful. They're just also extremely not new. Simple neural networks have been in use for decades for things ranging from handwriting recognition to web traffic analysis. And yes, even video game AI. So these are not scripted sequences. The AI is determining when your allies choose to advance and how to best help you out in combat. And chatbots. The main difference is that they run much faster on modern hardware. If I had to distill down what artificial narrow intelligence really means then, I would say it's like having a thousand monkeys at a thousand typewriters with a thousand pieces of reference material for what the outputs are supposed to look like. With enough trial <laughs> and error then, they do arrive at a point where they're likely to spit out a correct or at least correct enough solution. Then we take all those monkeys and we take a snapshot of the model state and we start feeding it inputs for both fun and profit. What ANI is to a brain then is kind of what a single app is to a computer. It's a building block. It's something your brain is capable of, but it's just one of its many, many functions. Shifting gears a bit then, what would artificial general intelligence look like? Well, it would need to be able to handle everything we've talked about so far, just like your brain can take some past experiences and turn them into a new creation, but Again, like your own brain, it would need to be able to run many of these models concurrently and continuously train and iterate on them rather than relying on fixed snapshots. So that's the difference right now between, for example, a human and this AI that they're using. The humans are more adaptable. They can draw upon more. They can learn more on the fly. They can integrate different things and put them together. While this, the AI that they're doing, ANI, I guess he's calling, <clears throat> is not really able to do that, maybe in time. But as of now, we're not there yet. So I guess for a lot of people who uh, are afraid that AI will take your job or whatever, I guess what it would be is, how can I say? Um, if your job is literally just sitting there repetitively doing something completely brainless with no conscious thought, right? with no aspect of having an interaction with humans that you need to communicate in a way that maybe has emotion in it right like for example ai can be used as a very general way to handle customer service but when you get an upset customer that's looking for an outright solution to a problem that's not a standard thing you need to have a human involved right i think a lot of companies sadly are missing that fact and they're just doing all of their customer service with these AI now and then people don't get any problem solved as a result. <clears throat> Imagine if you were to go to the store right now and in the old, whole store, the entire store was automated 
there's not a human in the place. So what if I really need to help with something, but I can't really explain it in a in a proper manner? What if um, there's an extenuating circumstance that the AI isn't programmed to handle? So now you just don't get help. Would you go to that store again? Right? So I feel like right now, sure, there's probably no problems with AI completely overrunning sectors of jobs and things. But as this AI advances and evolves, if it goes from ANI to AGI, then maybe we are in trouble. Maybe we're going to find out that AI can easily do a whole bunch of stuff that humans have already done. Now, here's the funny part. <clears throat> I talked about this. I don't know if it was on this show, but I know I talked about it recently. There was a really interesting social media post that's been going around and going viral in the last like couple of months. And the post is from a woman. And she posts up, you know, I hear a lot of discussions about AI doing things that humans used to do. Like, for example, generating music or art, right? I want my AI to wash my clothes, do my dishes, and clean my house for me so I have more time to make music, right? And paint art. I don't want my AI to make music, write, and paint art so I have more time to clean my house. Why is it that we seem to be doing the opposite? If we have AI that's able to learn, why don't we just get it in control of the menial tasks none of us like to do and we feel our time wasters? Instead, it seems like we're, we're so apt to get it to learn things that we like to do as humans. Why are we doing that? You see? It seems like we're doing this ass backwards. Is it because corporate entities feel that there's more profit in emulating the creative stuff rather than the boring stuff? Because I think that's really where the fear is. If AI helps us to spend more time on what we feel is meaningful time, spending of our time, then who cares? But when you're hearing things, AI is going to do this and do this, but I want to do that. Well, AI is going to do it too bad. Well, why are we doing that? That doesn't seem to make sense, does it? Right? Like, <laughs> okay. Only then would an AGI have the ability to truly learn and adapt to new things, bringing it closer to that classical definition of AI and really blur the lines between machine learning and machine consciousness. The problem is, even if we had software that sophisticated, we are nowhere close to being able to run an AGI, even on a modern supercomputer, let alone on your AI smartphone. But, all right, Linus, you still haven't explained why any of this is even a problem. I mean, free range meat is just marketing bollocks too, so who cares? <laughs> well, free range. Truthfully, in most cases, I don't. I mean, Cooler Master's AI thermal paste snafu. I was never bothered by it because I never expected my paste to be sentient anyway. <laughs> but there are situations where this kind of marketing can have an impact on user safety and therefore does matter. Let's talk about Tesla. Mr. Musk has said, among other things, that any vehicle from 2019 onward will be able to reach full autonomy. And he's certainly put out some impressive demos, both canned and even in the form of public beta software that you really can use. And that's really cool, but unfortunately, it isn't much more than that. You see, to operate a vehicle safely, it's not enough to be trained with images of painted lines and traffic cones, stop signs, pedestrians, vehicle telemetry data. It's not even enough to be trained to predict the likely maneuvers of nearby vehicles and life forms. On the road, anything can happen. And by definition, by its very definition, ANI is not capable of handling an edge case that it has never seen before. Even if it was, by the way, I have some really bad news for you Tesla owners out there. Hardware 3.0 has about 144 tops or trillion operations per second worth of processing power. For context, Windows 11 Recall, a feature that does little uh. more than take screenshots and analyze your PC usage for search, asks for 40 tops. Now to be clear, tops is not a be all end all measure of performance, and there is no way that Microsoft has optimized the code for recall nearly as much as Tesla has for full self-driving. 
but this should still illustrate the point that Tesla either did or should have known that a vehicle with the AI capabilities of a family wow. of iPhone 15 Pro users would never achieve that kind of real-time contextual awareness that's required for complex situations like operating a motor vehicle, and they misrepresented its capabilities in order to sell more software that was never going to leave beta. That is gonna be a doozy of a class action. And it's a common story that has led to this current mess where fuzzy definitions and impossible promises have turned AI into this meaningless buzzword like all the rest of them. Yep. All of them refer to legitimate, useful technologies, some of which have really come to fruition, but their meanings have become diluted with overuse. And it means that when computer cognition finally happens, we're gonna have to call it something completely different in order to differentiate it from all of the mm. marketing wank. On the subject of marketing, calling ANI AI wasn't an accident. The people behind that marketing know what you think AI means. Right. They know that the promise and the mystique behind the term is tantalizing, and they know you'll click on an article that is interviewing an AI expert who discusses how dangerous or already alive it is. They want you to buy into their hype. They want you to buy into their stocks. What we have now though really are decent summarization engines and lukewarm guessing machines that are tuned for working with different types of media. They can't reason. And anyone who's seen ChatGPT get something ridiculously confidently wrong can <laughs> attest to that. And they also can't understand why they get these things wrong, which means they can't learn or improve on their own, even if you explicitly tell them. They also have a finite number of things that they can remember, called tokens, which limit their ability to maintain a train of thought for very long. Anyone who's tried to get ChatGPT to write a novel or even a moderately complex Python script can probably attest to that. I didn't know that it had a token limitation, but I'm sure that's just based on money. Like they're not gonna let you use AI to infinitely do something because it would cost too much. So they give it limited tokens. I'm sure if someone really wanted to use AI for something professional, there would be an ability to keep going. It would just cost a lot more, right? Of course, as time goes on, some of these limitations will begin to lift, and these ANI models will start to look more and more like AGI to the layperson. <laughs> I mean, just ask the guy who had Bing fall in love with him. But at the end of the day, it's still the same thing as it's always been. To paraphrase a paper co-written by Emily Bender and Alexander Collar, it's a hyper-intelligent octopus that is observing and learning the patterns that are expected of communication and repeating them back more accurately over time. So when faced with a novel situation, like a bear attack, that octopus has no hope of being able to guide you on how to defend yourself with the materials you have on hand. It has no concept of bear or stick, only what words most closely match the pattern that it has previously observed. To further illustrate this, if you haven't tried it before, try to craft a prompt that coaxes stable diffusion to spit out something very specific. It turns out it's pretty challenging, and when it finally does it, it's generally composed of a mosaic of shapes and patterns from its training. I don't know what the hell he's talking about now. So basically what he's saying is AI is book smart, but not street smart. You can program AI through experience to give you answers, but it doesn't actually understand the answers that it's giving you. It doesn't know what it means. And because of that, it's not able to on the fly give you all the answers you would ever need because it doesn't have that level of comprehension, right? Like for example, there's some people who can sit here and study a course in like university and they'll know everything about a certain subject but then if you need to take that knowledge and apply it to doing it in a job, they can't do it. They just fail miserably. They make mistakes. They flounder. They fall right on their own face. They don't have that level of adaptability and knowledge and understanding. They could literally sit there and read the book and regurgitate the book for you word for word. But when it comes to applying what they're supposed to have learned in the book to an understanding level of application, they can't apply it. And that's what he's saying is with AI right now, it can't apply anything it's learned. It can pretend to be intelligent. It can pretend to be a human, but it doesn't have the level of understanding and application that humans truly have. I get that. Now I kind of get that 100%. But that's where we are now, right? This is a video from 10 days ago. This very well could change 
over time, right? But right now, I think what it is, is, is it's a level of money and time investment to actually make a true AI, a true, well, I guess they're calling it SI now, synthetic intelligence. We would have to take all these models, but you'd have to like all put them into one. And can you imagine having a model of all of that put into one, the time and money it would take? Probably decades and billions of dollars. And who's willing to invest all of that when it could all fail and not actually work, <laughs> right? So, okay. Well, that was a fascinating video. That was a good watch. Thank you to whoever submitted that one. And that's it for part one of DSP versus the Internet episode 70. I hope that you're all enjoying. And I'll see you in the next part. Remember, if you become a member today, you can be the person to submit the clips for next week. Thanks a lot. See you in the next one.